from Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Harry Poulton, the ship is indemnity. Johnny, how soon can you get to Buffalo? Six hours by train. Take a plane. All right, I'll take a plane. Why? So you can get on this case while it's still hot. Get on what case, Harry? Atlantic Central Railway. Some guys knocked over one of their boxcars last night and heisted half the load. We carry a blanket policy on all their freight, so get going. Yes, sir, Mr. Poulton, right away. And watch your expense account. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Harry Polden, Shipper's Indemnity, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures incurred during investigation of Atlantic Central Railway's claim regarding missing freight or the story of the 1008. Expense account item, transportation, plane fare, Hartford to Buffalo, $48.16, plus cab fare, $6.35, to the main offices of the Atlantic Central Railway, where a tall, heavy-set man in a dusty blue surge pulled a cold cigar from the side of his mouth and spun a swivel chair in my direction. I'm Abe Grimm's, Dollar. Sit down. Now, let me close this door. Well, you didn't take long getting him. I wasn't very far away. I'm the cinder bull for this outfit, and I'd be doing what you're going to do if it was like the old days. Only Shipper's Indemnity handles the insurance, and it's our job now. That's the service you pay for, Mr. Grimm. Uh, when they stuck me in this desk, I'd been knocking dead heads around for 20 years and seeing they got themselves 30 days on the road, gang. Now I'm just... I guess they figure I'm too old. Well, maybe you can give me a hand on this. Well, I'd like to, John. I need some action. You want to tell me about it, Mr. Grimms? You bet. Atlantic Central hustled six gully jumpers a day up to Rochester. Five hours after the 1008 leaves here last night, she jerks up at Batavia so the clowns can water her down. That's when the Donegan notices one of her brownies is busted open and half the jig is gone. So, right away, he wang doodles a copper buster up the line and... Uh, are you getting this? I think so. Translated, you mean the brakeman at Batavia found the boxcar had been broken into and half the cargo stolen, and he phoned ahead to the telegraph office. That's it. All sorts of stuff on the car. Don't know what all's going yet. It was a make-up, any kind of freight, you know. I got the poodles over in the bullpen looking up the invoices to see exactly what's missing. It'll take a while. Good, that'll help. Who is in charge of the loading here? Andy Matson. Been with us 13 years. He inspected it and sealed it down himself. I talked to him already, but call him in if you like. Well, I might want to see him later. What about the brakeman in Batavia? A gandy dancer, Skeeter Minkowski. Nah, he couldn't have done it. That highball only lingered there long enough to get water. Can't unload a brownie in three minutes. Take more like three hours. What other stops did she make? One. Six minutes at the junction, 15 miles outside of here, waiting for a hot-shot passenger to get by. And all in all, the train stopped ten minutes at the most. Eh? Not long enough to unload a kitty car. An uh, engineer named Aropa claims he spotted a name in a red dress hanging around the yard yesterday afternoon. And the boys at the roundhouse say the same dame was in asking questions about trains leaving. Said she was from a newspaper. She give a name? Ruth Smith. I checked. No newspaper in town got any Ruth Smith working for him. Well, she's our tipster. Let's get somebody out to look for it. Already got somebody out doing that. Good. Now, uh, along the route up to Rochester, between here and Batavia, there, there must be a highway running parallel to the track somewhere. And whoever cracked into that boxcar had to get aboard at the junction, then toss the stuff from the moving train and jump off somewhere this side of Batavia. And there had to be a truck following along on the road to pick up the stuff in the dark. You been out there yet, Mr. Grimms? No. Kind of thought I'd wait around and see what sort of bulwarkers the insurance companies are turning out these days. <laughs> I like you, Johnny. You're all right. You figured how it was done fair. Other guys that are hemmed and hawing around asking train crews questions I already asked. Well, what's next? Find out who did it. <laughs> kind of frisky, ain't you? I like that, too. Hey, um, have you got a car I can borrow, Mr. Grimms? I got a Jeep and a chauffeur to go with it. Who's the chauffeur? Me. You said you might want me to help you. I bought the thing from Army Surplus. I want to see if I got a bargain. Expense account item, $4.38 for gasoline, which went into a Jeep that Eve Grimms and I used to follow the lonely stretch of old road that ran parallel to the Atlantic Central Railroad tracks. 
Two miles beyond the junction, we found heavy-duty tire marks, which could have been made by a truck, which could have left the road, then driven over the flats as far as the embankment to pick up freight, which could have been thrown from the moving train. Following the right of way, we found several such tire marks at several points turning off the road, but no building nearby. Finally, at one place, we found an unpainted shanty that stood barren and lonely against the sky. It belonged to a man named Bogatus. Big truck! You're dang right I did, mister. You're dang boodily doodle right. Woke me up, it did. Well, what did the truck look like? Huh? Do you remember what the truck looked like? Yellow. Yellow it was. All yellow. Seen it plain, even though it was night. You haven't noticed the license number? You kidding, sonny. All right, forget it. Did you happen to notice any lettering on the truck, Mr. Bogata? Don't read. Never learned. Never believed in it. No. Well. It don't make no difference, though. It wasn't nothing writ on it anyhow. Oh. The trucks usually got printing on them. Dang things making all that noise. Grunting and heaving and waking a man out of his sleep. Ain't had nothing like that since the army maneuvered here in 41. No, sir. Are you going to stop it? Well, I hope so. Good. Did you happen to see who was driving the truck? Nope. Do you know about what time it was here? Nope. Did you happen to say anything to the nope. man? Nope. Well, do you know in which direction it went from yep. here? Yep. Huh? They turned around and headed back for Buffalo. Which is exactly what we did, back to Buffalo, where we began to look with the help of the police for a big yellow truck with no lettering on it. We tried garages, trucking concerns, and any place big enough to hide such a truck. It wasn't an easy job, but it turned up. Hello? Hello, Donna. Got a yellow truck all loaded down with stolen freight. What? Yeah. Meet you over at the West End Viaduct. Highway Patrol just found it. Good. Only one thing. It's wrecked. The passing motorist had a flat tire right here. He got out of his car to fix the flat and saw here where it tumbled down. Good tumble. Must be 30 feet anyhow. Yeah, they're trying to get the driver out of the cab now. He may still be alive. They're using acetylene torches. Ten minutes later, the ambulance crew dragged the driver out of the twisted cab. The interns worked on him for a short time, and one of them straightened up, handed me a billfold. Well, here you are. His name's Blakey. Blakey. Rick's Blakey. Mm Mm-hmm. For the moment, he won't live another five minutes. Fractured skull, neck broken. If you've got any questions to ask, you better hurry. Thank you. Blakey. Blakey, listen to me. Listen, you haven't got long. We know this is all stolen cargo in your truck. We want to know who worked with... Jake. Get Jake. Jake? Jake who? Jake. Jake slurped me, put it in gear, and rolled me over the side of the road. Get him, Mr. Cop. Get him for doing this to me. Uh. I stayed around the wrecked truck watching Eve Grimm's crew stacking the cargo, and then I saw something that could have fallen out of Blakey's wallet when the intern handed it to me. It was a card. On one side was printed, Horseshoe Bar and Grill. And there was an address underneath it. But on the other side was written, Jake, 8 o'clock Tuesday. He's always there. (laughs) The horseshoe bar and grill was short on lights and even shorter on drinks. After a couple, I signaled the bartender. Yeah? Another one? Uh Uh-huh. Sure. Name trouble, pal? I'm here to see Jake. Here's your drink. He been in here tonight? That'll be 50 cents. Jake hangs around here, doesn't he? Look, the minute you walk in, I look at your feet and I say to myself, flatty, gumboots, glim-heeled cop. (laughs) Not city hall type cop, but something else, I say. Something different that uh, still spells law. I was asking about a guy named Jake. Something else, I say. Maybe private people. And I say, if he's working, he's got himself a bib. <laughs> and a bib means it don't come out of his pocket when he's around looking for somebody and asking for guys. Will this help? Oh, thanks. Old Abe took a great picture. Uh, what was you asking? About a guy named Jake. Sit tight, Samus. I'll tip you when he comes in. An hour went by, and about the time I was wondering if I was going to be able to write that five bucks off on the expense account, the bartender slipped out from behind the bar and went through a door in the back marked private. 
I finished my drink and strolled after him. He was just hanging up the phone as I walked in. Oh, there's a lot of customers waiting to be served out front. Yeah, I want to get right back to... Wait a minute. Yeah? Have we got some unfinished business? Well, yes and no. I come back here to slip myself a quick smoke and the phone is ringing. You'll never guess who it is. Jake. What's his last name? How do I know? Across the bar, a guy's just Jake or Sam around. Anyhow, Jake says he ain't coming by tonight. He called you up to tell you that? No. No, you see, Jake says he lost his glasses when he was here last night. He was called to ask if I found him. Did you? Uh, no. But Jake says that uh, if I do find him, I can send him over to the Embassy Hotel. That's where he is. Room 210. Embassy Hotel. Where is that from here? Two blocks north. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> sure, anytime. <laughs> anytime you got an expensive cap. I walked over to the Embassy Hotel, and naturally enough, there was no one in room 210 named Jake. As a matter of fact, there was no room 210. But when I stepped outside and started back for the Horseshoe Bar and Grill, a pair of wide shoulders and a coat collar fell and stepped beside me. He shoved something against my back. Let you and me kind of turn in here. I, I blast you right here and you know it. In the alley. I want you to meet a friend of mine. Jake? Hmm. How'd you guess? Okay, hold it. Here he is, Jake. A tall, thick figure with an odor of fine cologne around it stepped from the shadows. His hat was down and his collar was up. He stood very close in front of me and asked, Why do you want me? Who are you? I'll ask you first. I... All right. Frisk him, Trench. See who he is. Everything became very quiet then, except for one voice that belonged to a man who had died earlier that day. I kept hearing it. Get him. Get him for doing this to me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first... This Wednesday night and every Wednesday night over most of these same CBS stations, we're invited to hear the Bing Crosby Show. Bing Crosby with the music of John Scott Trotter, the Rhythm Airs, Ken Carpenter, and of course the top name star each week is his special guest. Here's the show designed for the whole family. A pleasant and diverting mixture of music and merriment, guided by the one and only Bing Crosby. Plan now to make Wednesday night Crosby night on your listening schedule. That's the Bing Crosby Show every Wednesday night on CBS. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I was lying in a dirty alley with my face up against a cold brick wall, and something warm was dripping down the back of my neck. I didn't move. I couldn't. There was a steady ringing in my head and my body seemed far away. I struggled to my feet and headed for the man who had led me into this. What do you want? Hey, what's this all about? Let go of me! Look, I've been beaten and slugged and frisked, all because I talked to the wrong guy. I looked for you in the bar, but they told me you went home. Now spit it out. Spit what? Does that remind you of anything? You tipped Jake off that I was looking for him. Why? Let go of me. I can't talk like this. If you can breathe, you can talk. Come on. Look, Jake's a steady customer of mine. I gotta treat him right. I've never seen you before in my life. What's Jake's full name? What does he do? And where can I find him? I don't know. You don't know what? Anything about him. Except that he's a big black haired guy who dresses like a bookie, Flash. He just comes in with some guys and drinks. The name is Jake Samuels. He has a sidekick named Trench. I don't even know his last name. What does Jake do? I don't know. He don't say nothing personal to me. Well, what do you think he does? Maybe he plays the horse's books. How do I know? And you don't know where he lives? Mister, if he owed me a hundred dollar bar bill, I couldn't find his house. It was late and my head hurt and I wanted to lie down somewhere. So I made for the Imperial Hotel Eve Grames had recommended. I took a shower and polished off the drinks they sent up. Then I felt well enough to call Grimms again. But before I lifted the phone, he walked into my room with some interesting information. Sorry you got beat up, Johnny. It's all right. I'm covered with accident insurance, you know. I wish I could help you with this Jake Samuels fella, but I never heard of him. Thanks anyway, but I'll, I'll run him down sooner or later. I do have something that might help, Johnny. 
Yeah? We checked all that cargo that was found in the right truck, and I don't know exactly what it means, but everything was there except one barrel. What was that? A barrel. And listen to this. Of all things, a barrel of jeweler's rouge. The stuff they use for gem polishing? That's what an intelligent friend of mine told me. It was insured that... Uh, when I go right here... $247. Now, why would anybody want that? Well, who sent it? A uh, jeweler by the name of Ralph Morton. Morton Jewelry Company, 1312 Shenandoah Street. Sent to Michael Adelson, A-D-E-L-S-O-N, 177 Carling Terrace, Boston, Mass. Adelson, huh? Yeah, Adelson or Adelson. Know him, Johnny? Uh. Not sure. Something rings a bell. Well, thanks a lot, Grims. I'll have a talk with that jeweler, Ralph Morton, in the morning. In the morning, I rented a small car and started for the Morton Jewelry Company on Shenandoah Street. I found it in the middle of the block, a small, hungry-looking neighborhood jewelry store. But the most interesting thing about it was standing in a doorway across the street from it. A middle-aged man... He was a plant, if ever I saw one. I ignored him and entered the store. There was a small man with thinning brown hair bent over the insides of a watch and a snappy-looking blonde job dusting counters about four paces away. I spoke to the watchmaker. He took out his eye lens and looked up. Yes? Two days ago, you shipped some jeweler's rouge to Michael Adelson in Boston. Yes, I, I did. What about it? Well, it was hijacked out of the freight car yesterday. Oh. <laughs> Clumsy this morning. A hijack, you say? Stolen. Somebody wanted it pretty bad. They passed up a lot of other stuff more valuable. Well, I... Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator with the Shippers Indemnity Company. Oh, it was insured, of course. Well, you it... should know. For $247. I'm sorry it was stolen. I presume your company will have to pay for it. We don't mind paying if we know what we're paying for. What do you mean by that? Why would anybody want to steal Rouge? I'm sure I don't know. Whoever did it went to a lot of expense and trouble, and they murdered a man for good measure. Andrea! Why must you always be knocking things down? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Morton. My hand slipped. Well, be more careful. You say they killed a man, Mr. Dollar? Surely they did not do this over my little shipment of jewelers, Rouge. It sounds stupid, I know, but it was done. Why did you send Rouge all the way to Boston to Michael Adelson when you could buy the same stuff there? Oh, no, you're wrong. This is a private formula I developed myself. I sell it to a number of widely scattered people. They seem to prefer my mixture. Uh-huh. Who is Michael Adelson? A designer of expensive jewelry. His reputation in the field is first class. Well, Mr. Morton... That's all. That's all for today. But I'll be back. All the time I was in there, the blonde, Miss Phillips, kept her blue eyes and her pink ears focused on me. My common sense spoke to my vanity and told her to play dead. She was interested in more than my profile. Outside, I spotted the plant across the street. I thought he was growing in the doorway until I approached him. He ducked clumsily and walked away with such obvious nonchalance that I was tempted to follow him, and I did to a corner drugstore with a good view of the Morton Jewelry Company. We shared adjoining stools while he cut into a butterscotch sundae. Hey, uh, a little more butterscotch on this, please. It's out the 20 cents special. What do you want for 20 cents? Butterscotch. Mm, okay. Okay, I don't pay for it anyway. What's the job? What's the... Huh? Oh, it's you. Uh, beat it. Yeah, we're both in the same racket. Oh, insurance? Are you working on the Arcadia job, too? No. What's the Arcadia job? What are you working on? A railroad hijack. What's the Arcadia job? Oh, Ben Sanchez is my name. How do you do, Dollar? How do you do? Yeah, I'm working independent. I I, I don't take divorce cases. In two months, I haven't had a decent job. But I got myself a little old idea. You see, three months ago, a wholesale jewelry house was pried open, see? And 250000 worth of uncut stuff disappeared. And so far, none of it has showed up anywhere. And somebody will pay a lot of money if it's found. Especially an outfit called the Erie Mutual Fidelity. What's Morton's edge on it? Well, I 
I could be wrong, but I've seen that guy operate for a number of years. Here's see? the butter spot. Oh, thanks, thanks. It's a little jewelry store stuck off in a forgotten part of the city, you know, buys watches for ten bucks and sells them for twelve. Well, lots of guys do that. Yeah, yeah, but they don't own a little old eighty five thousand dollar house in the Long Acre section with two new cars in the garage. And you think Morton has the Arcadia jewels? I think he's been a fence for a long time. And there hasn't been nothing good defense since the Arcadia job. He has a record? He has. Say what they steal of his from a railroad car. Just some jeweler's ruse, that's all. Oh, gee, maybe I'm wasting my time. Well, I hope you... Pardon me. The blonde came out of the jewelry store with a coat and hat on and climbed in an automobile parked down the street. I made for my You Drive It model and followed her. At eight cents a mile, I was out about a buck twenty-five before she shut off a key and coasted into a curb. I went past her, around the block, parked the car, and sauntered back to the house she had entered. It was just a house, nothing special, a few more bricks, maybe flagstones instead of cement for a wharf. But that was all. I stood looking straight at the house. When it turned out, I should have been looking straight behind me. Why don't you kind of put your hands behind your neck? That's it. You won't need this heater. Seems to me I've heard that voice before, and it was just as unpleasant. <laughs> Now, why don't you kind of walk into the house? I would have been amused to know that I kind of wanted... Sorry. He would have been amused to know that I kind of wanted to get into that house as much as he kind of wanted me to. We went up the walk arm in arm. He opened the door and graciously allowed me to enter first. The living room was empty, but I could hear voices Johnny, plainly in the next that room. Line. That stuff was worth more than you've ever seen before. Oh, shut up. I took a long time looking for two guys. Oh, what a lousy couple of chiselers I could stuff with. Hey, it's me, Trench. I've got a visitor. Trust in this world. Hey, it's me. We stood there, Trench beaming and me frowning, and they came into the room. The guy was big, black-haired, and overdressed, the way the bartender had tagged him. It was Jake Samuels, all right. And hanging on his elbow, giving him a hot ear, was the jeweler's dame. Samuels wasn't in too good a frame of mind. I'll blast it all over town. And you won't be able to touch me, because I got protection. Now, will you shut up? I got to talk with a friend. Johnny Dollar, Jake. Yes. Welcome to my house. Just the same, it's too bad you had to come. This isn't exactly the day we're receiving. Well, I work weekends, and this is the only time I could make it. <laughs> Jake will do the talking. What is it you want to see me about? Last night and the night before. Oh, uh, you mean when we roughed you up? That and the Atlantic Central job and Rick's Blakey, whom you killed at the wheel of his truck. Then there's the little matter of your blonde girlfriend here. I saw her in Morton's jewelry shop. Uh, she couldn't possibly be the phony reporter who was hanging around the railroad yards. Or uh, could she? Jake, this guy really knows... Shut up, it. shut up. Is that all you can say? Yeah, is that all you can say? Shut up. Well, listen here. Shut up. I won't. You owe me $45,000. What are you talking in front of him for? What do I care about him? That's your worry. $5,000 for $300,000 worth of jewelry. <laughs> Go on now. Get out of here. Take what you got and consider it lucky. We took all the risk. Now beat it. All right. All right, I'll beat it. When I come back, you're going to wish you were dead, Jake. Go on, you cheap... When she reached the door, she pulled a gun from somewhere, spun, and Trench got both slugs. He dropped groaning to the floor, and I kicked his gun into a corner. Jake Samuels stood frozen to the rug, looking at the barrel of the automatic she held. The next one's going to be for you, Jake. You going crazy or something? Put down that gun. Go on. Say shut up to me now. Go on, say it. You yellow toothed woman, Peter. Andrea, you're making a big mistake. No. Am I going to get my 45000 or not? But I uh, I don't have that much in the house. Well, then call somebody and get it. Or come up with some jewelry. Uh, yes, tomorrow. T tomorrow, I promise. Not I'll... tomorrow. Today, now. Miss Phillips. I'm talking to him. And don't you get any ideas? Look, there's only one way for you to get out of this, and that's to kill everybody in this room. If you leave me alive, I'll track you down. That's what I get paid for if you... Can I let you... I know what I'm doing. If you leave Trench or Jake alive, they'll get you, too. You bet we will. Oh, I'm so scared. Come on, Jake. The money. Right now, you've only got a petty crime against you. Do any more, and it'll be murder. You'll last a month, if that long. What are you getting at? Give me these two guys. 
Are you kidding? Turn them over to me and I'll go the limit in helping you. I'll forget the 5000 you got from them. The most you can get is a year in the county. 5000 clear is good dough. What happens to them? They're wanted for murder. I'll say in my report, you turn them over to me. Maybe you won't get anything. Are you level? Well, of course he isn't, Andrea. I'm don't. as level as a guy can get. Come on. Give me the gun, Miss Phillips. I don't know. It's that or a murder rap. Come on. Stay away from me. It's freedom or murder. Which one do you want? I... Give me the gun. Here. Here, take it. I didn't want to do this anyway for the start. This isn't living. This is... This is dying every day. You're lucky. You found it out in time, Miss Phillips. You know, except for the guy in the gas station, nobody ever called me Miss Phillips. And that told him is the way it all wound up. I called the police and they took things in hand. The jewels, of course, were... Buried in the barrel of the jeweler's rouge, and Miss Phillips, knowing that Morton was unloading them in Boston, sold the information to Jake and friend for $50,000, which she didn't get. The Arcadia Wholesale Company jewels were in the stuff the police picked up. Oh, by the way, you'll notice one item on the expense account, $4.85. That was a gift, a foam rubber seat for Eve Grimm's surplus Jeep. Total expenses, $312. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Harry M. Popkin United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Ted DeCorsia, Pat McGeehan, Harold Durenforth, John Daner, Bill Boucher, Gene Bates, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.